Hi, my name is Elizabeth Schwartz, and I'm going to spend a few minutes today answering some frequently asked questions about adoption. I'm a Florida lawyer, and I'm board certified by the Florida Bar as an adoption attorney, and I'm also an elected fellow of the Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Attorneys. But I'm going to talk today about adoption. My practice is focused on private placement adoption. Adoptions uh, can happen out of the foster care system, and I do sometimes finalize those adoptions, but typically with those public adoptions, you don't need an attorney until the very end uh, because you're working with an adoption uh, agency and um, you know, like a contractor of DCEF, the Department of Children and Families, a CBC, a community-based care organization. So um, the, the use of a private attorney uh, doesn't typically happen until sort of towards the tail end. Uh, I do private placement adoptions, uh, which means I match uh, expectant mothers uh, with hopeful adoptive parents. That's probably you, HAPS or PAPS, potential adoptive parents. So it is a roller coaster, I know. I wanna try to answer a few questions uh, to give you a sense of how it works and how I work. So I do about a dozen to two dozen placements a year really ebbs and flows. Um, some years it'll be a lot, some years it'll be far fewer. Uh, generally, I would say that there are just fewer adoptions than there had been uh, in prior decades. Um, depending on your politics, uh, you know, that's a good or a bad thing. Uh, there definitely are fewer unwanted pregnancies, so um, that often results in uh, fewer adoption placements. Uh, certainly, the internet has uh, been a game changer. Uh, folks are, uh, in, in good and bad ways, right? Uh, folks are able to uh, market themselves uh, in different ways, uh, but also uh, it's resulted in an increase in scams because expectant mothers uh, can sometimes be working with multiple families, uh, taking money from multiple families. And so we try to put a lot of safeguards in place to make sure that that does not happen. I typically keep a queue of uh, PAPS, potential adoptive parents, uh, that is around a dozen. Uh, and that ranges from couples that are gay to straight to single men, single women, uh, just all shapes and sizes and stripes. So when folks say, how many people do you have in your queue? You know, if I say you're number 13, it doesn't necessarily mean that you wouldn't be matched until the 12 people ahead of you were matched already. Uh, it would mean you could be first because what you want in a situation and what the birth parents want in the situation uh, needs to mesh. Uh, so so um, that's how that works. Uh, the uh, uh, match time, match weight, uh, is uh, very much depends on how open you are. So if you are open racially, gender-wise, if you're open, you know, to some drug exposure, uh, it's um, really helpful uh, to be as open as you possibly can be. Um, that would very much decrease your wait time. On the other hand, if you want that proverbial unicorn baby, uh, that could take longer. Frankly, I usually tell people, think about a nine-month wait, like a pregnancy. Um, that That is more or less often the average. But having said that, sometimes it could be three weeks uh, and sometimes it can be over a year. Uh, again, really direct correlation with how open you are. Looking at my list of questions. Um, you can be sex specific for sure, um, but just know that that really will uh, uh, oftentimes increase your waiting uh, period. Um, and the reason for that is that very often when uh, expectant moms come uh, for assistance, they come to be matched. They are not uh, uh, late enough in their pregnancy to know uh, what the gender of the baby is. So, and, and I believe, I know this is other lawyers work differently. I believe that if, if someone comes to me and she needs help and she wants to make an adoption plan, I want to support her through that. And I want to give her the help she needs. And um, I don't want her bonding with that baby in utero unnecessarily. Um, so, uh, but it does increase the amount of funds that would be at risk in the event of your, in the event that the adoption abrupted. 
Uh, and let me get to that. Uh, let me get to money <laughs> without too long, because I know that's always everyone's big question. How much does it cost? Um, I typically tell people to have 50000 set aside. It's not likely going to cost 50000 unless the birth mother's expenses were crazy high. And I do sometimes have those cases where, you know, I expect a mama comes to me and she's three weeks pregnant and she wants to make an adoption plan and she's homeless. So um, those uh, cases can be very expensive because we in Florida can pay her living and medical expenses up to six weeks postpartum. Uh, in Florida, we don't have to get any kind of court approval if uh, her expenses are going to be less than $5,000. But if it's more than 5000 which it frequently is, especially if we have a long uh, match period, long period between when she comes for assistance and when she's delivering, um, we, we get a court order to, um, the court reviews the budget and approves every penny spent. So um, if we do get an approval to give her more funds, we will. Um, and if she changes her mind, which she has the right to do uh, before she signs her consent, um, then what are the odds we're going to get that money back? Not, not very great. In Florida, she can sign her consent. She, the expectant mama, can sign her consent the earlier of 48 hours after birth or the day that she's authorized to be released from the hospital. So, you know, in an example that I had just recently, you know, woman checked in Wednesday night to uh, deliver and then Thursday, right after lunch, they were like, okay, you're good to go. So we were able to sign the consent that very next day. Uh, but typically they do keep uh, uh, women in the hospital for a good 48 hours. And uh, she signs the consent uh, right at 48 hours or as close to that as we can uh, manage. And uh, once that consent is signed, it is irrevocable. She cannot change her mind after that. So that is the waiting period. But of course, it's a nail-biting period up till that point because um, she can change her mind and decide she wants to parent. Um, and we don't have any recourse. Uh, we can't force her to sign an adoption consent. Um, so uh, most of my adoptions are somewhat open. And open means different things to different people. Uh, open can mean she knows your first names and that you live in the state of Florida. And she knows what you look like. And, you know, she's met you a couple of times. But open adoptions have been so um, facilitated very, very well with uh, just better technology. Google voice numbers, uh, password protected Instagram pages that are like not connected to your own Instagram page uh, where you can upload photos of the baby. Um, you know, there's all kinds of amazing platforms uh, where uh, letters and pictures can be shared without identities being shared. Um, certainly the advent of these third-party DNA tests has, uh, that's a whole other video. Um, Ancestry.com and DNA, you know, has, has meant that in the future, um, that, that, uh, anonymity, uh, might be compromised. Um, but, uh, but again, consent has been signed. The baby is yours. Even if by some crazy miracle she managed to show up at your doorstep, you know, on Christmas Eve, she can't um, ask for any more money. She certainly can't ask for the baby back. She's got no um, rights at that point. Um, I uh, do, just look at my questions here, um, hope that you will be able to meet your birth mother before birth. Some only meet uh, uh, at the hospital, but I think it's great if you can go to an ultrasound together or something like that, um, have dinner. Uh, the way that I work is I have social workers that I work with all over the state, and I do handle cases all throughout the country. And so we've got someone on the other end uh, meeting with the expectant mama and uh, making sure she gets to the doctor. And so that person would be able to facilitate uh, a meeting with you um, and, uh, and her, and we would hope that that would happen in advance of birth because that is great for everyone. All the social science research shows that it's ideal uh, for there to be some kind of face-to-face -face, um, uh, and, and for you guys to have some way to connect with one another, not the least of which would be for medical emergencies that would come up. Florida is a very adoption-friendly state, not only because um, those consents are irrevocable, 
not only because we can pay those living in medical expenses um, and then with a court order, uh, you know, really take good care uh, of her if she's got a long uh, match period, but also because the rights of an unmarried biological father are, um, you know, a little difficult for them to establish. And the reason for that is, I mean, I'm a daddy's girl, so it's it's not to ice out a father's rights, but it's to protect a woman's right to uh, make an adoption plan and not to be forced into co-parenting uh, with someone who's not going to be able to really support that child. So uh, if she does identify a birth father, if, uh, then uh, she, uh, then the father gets notice and he has the right to, uh, the obligation to file with Florida's putative father registry and to file with the court uh, a detailed plan of how he, not his mother, but how he uh, plans on uh, parenting the child and supporting the child. And if he doesn't do that, then um, he has uh, uh, no parental rights, essentially. If she doesn't identify, she, the expectant mama, if she doesn't identify a birth father before she signs the consent, um, no birth father has any rights. We get a certificate of search of that putative father registry, and um, you know he's, a, he's essentially a John Doe. Uh, and Florida does recognize a woman's right to privacy to not have to identify uh, a birth father if she is uh, doesn't want to and sometimes she's afraid um, you know lots of things can come up um, definitely uh, if she does identify a birth father um, he can sign in advance of birth um, he can sign uh, an affidavit of a non-paternity which I know sounds like a funny name for a father to sign if he is the father so what do you mean non-paternity um, but it's because the document itself says that he is not seeking to establish paternity. That's that's what it says. Um, so um, if uh, you do end up placing uh, out of state, uh, the um, ICPC process will have to be followed. ICPC is the Interstate Compact on the Placement of Children. A compact is uh, like uh, between states what a treaty is between nations to give you that analogy. So um, all of the states have signed on to the uh, ICPC and that interstate compact requires certain steps to be taken uh, before you can travel across state lines with a child for the purposes of adoption. So um, that typically takes a couple of weeks and you would notice in our intake form, one of the questions that we ask is, are you able to uh, be out of state for a period of time of a, of a couple of weeks. And now let me just say this, if you are a couple adopting, um, you don't both need to be there. As long as the baby is in that other state, you don't both need to be there. So, um, and even if you're a single person, frankly, I mean, I've had some folks, if, if the child is a drug exposed and the child needs to stay in the hospital for several weeks and you need to get back to work, um, you know, I've had clients send their parents, you know, whatever, uh, to be with the baby. So um, that's something that's important to know. Um, let's see. Uh, how does the abruption process work? Meaning, um, as I said earlier, uh, you know, are you able to get funds back if you, if the birth mother changes her mind? So you should be able to get money back from her, but we typically find that to be quite difficult. Uh, one thing that I've learned to do um, is to fight my instinct to have all my ducks in a row way in advance. Basically, I've had to learn to become a really good procrastinator because I refund my fees based on what's not already been earned. So, you know, I, I, I've been doing this lots of years and uh, I would, in, in the earlier days, find that if uh, a case were to abrupt, that I would have um, not a lot of funds to be able to refund to the adoptive families to move on to another match because I had done everything already. So I've learned I need to do less and you know uh, <laughs> uh, wait until uh, the consents are signed to do all the termination of parental rights documents, TPR uh, documents and the adoption finalization documents so that if God forbid it shouldn't work out uh, that I'm able to give more of your money back uh, or, or roll it into the next case. Um, and I would say, again, it sort of ebbs and flows, but I would say probably about 20% um, of uh, cases abrupt. So about two out of 10, uh, where 
either the birth mother's family swoops in and decides they're going to help her parent or she decides she's going to um, do it, go it alone. You know, she and the dad work it out. So um, I, I, I do give you itemized statements of every penny that has been spent. I mean, no matter what, even if your case works out, um, I give you itemized statements so you'll know where every penny went. Uh, and, um, and of course, we uh, take all measures that we possibly can. Uh, I'm a member of the Florida Adoption Council. We have a really great listserv where we post adoptive uh, matches, and that way we're able to ferret out scams a lot of times. Um, again, uh, also a member of the Academy, uh, the National uh, Academy of Adoption and Assisted Reproduction Attorneys, and so we also have a process to um, listserv to uh, 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 vet uh, these uh, cases. So, um, so we do uh, uh, for sure try to um, to avoid those scams whenever we can. But sometimes folks get taken, and sometimes she just changes her mind and decides she's going to do it. And uh, I will say one thing that I've learned not to get too woo-woo on here, but uh, I've learned that there's a family for every baby and a baby for every family. And if this gal changes her mind and decides to parent, then that wasn't your baby. And I know that's easy for me to say sometimes, but um, I do find that, you know, the baby, the right baby does come along. Um, let's see. Uh, the uh, last question uh, just has to do with Florida law, and I want to kind of walk you through uh, the process here a little bit. So um, whether your baby is born here or born elsewhere, uh, Florida law has three steps. And we, by the way, can finalize adoptions for folks who don't live here. So I've got many, many clients that I've never met. Maybe they don't live in Miami. Maybe they don't live in the state of Florida. Maybe they don't live in the U.S. Um, fl again, Florida law is very, very good uh, on, uh, on jurisdiction and our courts uh, and venue. And uh, our courts will, uh, in Miami, will accept uh, uh, these cases. And so um, what they happen in sort of three stages. There's placement, there's TPR, and there's finalization. Um, placement is that first court order that we get uh, right after the baby is born. Uh, and that placement order is what shifts. When the birth mother um, signs her consent, she signs it to me as the adoption entity. Um, in Florida, an adoption entity can be a licensed child placing agency, like when you think of a of an adoption agency, um, or it can be an attorney. An intermediary uh, is an attorney that places a child for adoption. So uh, when she signs that consent, she signs it to Elizabeth Schwartz. And so then uh, I want to immediately shift that legal custody over to you, um, not only so you can consent to medical treatment without any question, but also so that the child can be placed on your um, health insurance. And so we certainly like to get that done immediately. And so that's the placement order. And I typically get that placement order within, you know, a week or so of birth. Um, the second step is the TPR, termination of parental rights. That's what terminates the birth parent's parental rights. So that would be the um, birth mom who signs the consent. And uh, if there's an adoptive, excuse me, if there's a uh, unmarried biological father, birth father, whatever, whoever there is, and it, uh, unknown fathers, uh, that terminates uh, uh, his parental rights as well. Uh, and you don't need to come to court for either of those two orders, for the placement or the TPR. You don't need to come to court. Um, the third and final stage is the uh, adoption finalization. In Florida, that cannot happen until, the, uh, until 90 days post-placement. So uh, after those 90 days, uh, we can do an adoption hearing. They're typically very brief and very fun. Uh, I take pictures with the judges and stuff like that, and it's great. Um, I think pretty much all of our judges now allow you to finalize remotely, uh, meaning you would just have to have a notary where you are to swear you in to confirm your identities, and then, um, and then we do a brief adoption finalization hearing. If you are able to come to Miami, it's super fun. Um, so I would hope that you uh, do if you can. But otherwise, uh, we do remote finalization for that very brief um, but very important hearing. Uh, so I think that's everything. Um, hopefully this has been helpful and informative. Um, oh, fees. Fees. How do I work? Um, sorry. Uh, actually, and how do you get started? Okay, those two things. And then we'll wrap up. Oh my gosh, we're getting at 20 minutes. Okay. Um, so uh, very quickly, uh, I charge for my time for just trying to find folks matches. 
I have folks typically drop four hours into my trust account. Uh, my hourly right now is $450 an hour. I haven't changed it in a million years. And so that would be $1,800 uh, that you just pop into my trust account, which means it's still yours. And I just charge for my time uh, for sending you situations. You know, uh, typically when they come to me, I, you know, write them up, send them to you. Um, what kind of information do you get? Sometimes medical records, sometimes photos. Um, sometimes it's just sort of a um, intake sheet that kind of specs everything out. Um, every case is different. But uh, if you decide you want to proceed uh, with that case, then we figure out what exactly my level of effort is going to be. Uh, and um, that really varies case by case. In some cases, the birth mother comes to me and I do everything. I disperse the funds to her. I'm getting medical records. I'm you know doing everything under the sun, including the legal work. So then my fees would be a teensy bit higher. Um, Sometimes all I'm doing is the legal work. There's a social worker or somebody else that, that brings me the case and my fees are lower because all I'm doing is that court work, the, the adoption consent uh, preparation and the placement and the TPR and the finalization and then ICPC if you're going across state lines. Um, so we don't know what my fee is at the beginning because um, we're not matched yet. So that's why I just charge for my uh, hourly rate for the back and forth until we have a match. And then once we have a match, uh, then we know what my level of uh, work is gonna be. Uh, and what do you do to get started? Um, three things. I can send you an intake sheet, let me know. Send me an email, liz at elizabethschwartz.com. Um, and uh, we ask you to do a home study and a profile. Uh, home studies are, you might have even been referred to me by your uh, home study provider. Uh, so maybe you already know what a home study is, but it's um, super detailed uh, background checks and home visits and uh, report of who you are in the world. Um, and, uh, and then a profile is uh, kind of a sales piece. It's like, here's who we are and here's what kind of life we would give your baby. And um, those are both really important to have. The uh, profile I like to have by, uh, in two formats, uh, hard copy, physical copy, and um, also a PDF, uh, because some women I can't, don't have computer access, and then uh, and some do, and some want to have the physical copy, and then others just want the email. Uh, so um, those are, that's what I need. I'm happy to suggest home study providers to you, um, folks who can do your profile. Um, there are uh, lots of great professionals working in this world, uh, and I'm happy to help you uh, navigate those. Um, the thing I ask is that you uh, are responsive. You know, when I send you a situation, uh, I can't have you say, okay, we'll talk about it over dinner tomorrow. You know, I, I need you to, if you've got a partner, if you're going to be adopting with someone else, I need you to like confer with them because um, there definitely are more of you, more potential adoptive parents than there are uh, adoption situations. So they, they go fast and I want you to be considered. Uh, so hopefully this has been helpful. Uh, please uh, give this a listen and um, answer. Uh, I have hope, hopefully I've answered a lot of your questions. Uh, please ask me any other questions that may come up. Again, Liz at ElizabethSchwartz.com. And um, best of luck on the roller coaster that is adoption. Um, do have faith that your baby will find you and I'll be happy if I'm able to help um, be the person that, that helps make that happen. Uh, one great thing about the adoption world is that when you sign on with an attorney or an agency, it's not like signing an exclusive listing agreement with a real estate agent. You can work with lots of us and you can cast a wide net and I think we all recommend that you do do that. Um, so it's a really, um, it is a wacky journey oftentimes, but, but definitely worth it. Uh, I'm always available to address concerns, to answer questions. Um, I'm pretty compulsive on email. Uh, so email is usually a great way to get me, uh, and, um, hope to be able to help you form your forever family. So thanks for listening to this and 